All right, so today's talk is about nutrition and weight management. I'm um, we'll gonna give you a very broad general view on what nutrition is about and how we can use the knowledge, basic knowledge, in helping us sort of create a program for ourselves. If anything, I think it's a great time to even start some kind of dietary regimen to get ready for the holidays for most of us here. Um, just a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in Seattle, I was born in Hong Kong, but spent most of my life in Seattle, in the Northwest, where I did my undergrad at University of Washington. Then I spent 40 years in Illinois, in the Midwest, and finished my medical school there. So then 10 years ago, I moved to Southern California, where I finished my internal medicine residency, followed by two years of medical nutrition and weight management uh, fellowship. And that was back in 2010. So then, for three years, I was actually in my own private practice in downtown LA until six months ago, my old boss from uh, clinical nutrition at UCLA called me up and told me about this expansion that we're, we're undergoing in the valley and Westlake Village as well as Thousand Oaks, um, basically creating these medical plaza and multi-specialty clinics to really serve the community. Um, and so I decided, sure, it's a great time to stop working as hard as I was and, and join UCLA. And so now my home is in Thousand Oaks, or my new workplace is in Thousand Oaks in 100 Moody Court, where I practice internal medicine as well as medical nutrition and medical weight management. Uh, we are actually opening up our second medical weight loss clinic in, at the Thousand Oaks Sykes site as well in November, this month really. So I'm gonna start off with my talk with some basic pictures. So basically, we, we're here to deal with this whole idea of, or this increase in prevalence in everyone being overweight or obese. Um, not only are we overweight as, as human beings, but even our pets are now overweight, and it's been well known. Over 60% of American US adults are overweight or obese. A majority of my patients that I see nowadays are overweight or obese. Uh, this is just data from uh, N. Haynes, which is a, uh, a uh, foundation uh, where, made by the CDC, created by CDC, that basically tells us every year on what the prevalence of uh, U.S. adults are in, when it comes to being overweight or obese. And the color changes, and every year, you know, it started back in 1990s, and every year they would show the same map with different colorish, different colors and different uh, prevalence. And basically, whatever you see here in the dark red or orange shows the highest prevalence in uh, U.S. adults being overweight or obese. And this is the latest data back in 2012, where, again, 60% of our U.S. adults are obese and overweight. So when you go in to see your primary care physician, um, you know, besides the blood pressure and the pulse and the temperature that we take, we also calculate this number called a BMI, or the body mass index. This is basically an index or number that tells us, the physician, where you stand when it comes to you being at normal weight or underweight, overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. And a lot of times, most of my clients are really they fall within the uh, BMI of 25 and above. What that indicates to us is that you are at risk for certain things. Um, some of the data, a lot of research have been, has been done with the whole idea of this BMI and the index. And basically, the higher your BMI is, the more likely you'll be at risk for developing diabetes, high blood pressure, and even cancer. Some of the limitations for this uh, body mass index comes down to the fact that we don't take into account of uh, the person's culture or background. What this calculation here is, is basically your height and your weight. So it doesn't tell me what your bone structures are, what your race is, and it's well known that even in the Asian culture, Asian women in general has much less muscle mass compared to Caucasians, but it doesn't take into account of that either. So when you actually go in for this BMI, you have to realize that there are some limitations. A lot of my uh, male patients are considered to be overweight or obese, not because they truly have a lot of fat, but it's because they have a lot of muscle mass. So you always have to take into that account. Like if your husband or your spouse come home telling you, oh, 
I didn't know I was obese or overweight. But in reality, you got to think about what you're really made of. So why do we worry about the whole uh, idea of someone being overweight or obese? Basically, these are the conditions that we usually encounter as physicians. If we ignore the whole idea of someone being overweight and just think about these conditions themselves, such as osteoarthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, these are just sh uh, short ways I'm writing it, cancers, coronary artery disease, carpal tunnel, uh, being sleepy all the time, diabetes, hypertension, gout, uh, fatty liver, infertility, people not having periods, for, some, for whatever reason, urinary incontinence, and even a lot of the common skin findings uh, have a relationship when it comes to someone being overweight. So when I see patients who come in with these very common conditions, I will have to say 60% of these patients of mine are somewhat overweight or obese. So instead of treating, in my mind, in my philosophy is, instead of just treating the symptoms, why aren't we treating the problem, which, is, which comes down to your fat and the percentages of fat that you have? So in my practice, when I see my clients and my patients specifically, and besides you know, treating a common cold or treating a patient with elevated high blood pressure or a knee pain, I, most of my patients do undergo a very extensive uh, history, only because of the fact that I specialize in uh, medical nutrition and weight management. So naturally, I see overweightness as the source of problem for a lot of conditions. But what I do in my practice uh, really comes down to a full assessment that could last 45 to 60 minutes. Um, I start off with the history of my patients. What, what are you here for? What are the acute symptoms that you're experiencing? Then we talk about your medications. And a lot of times the medications really become the root of the problems. A lot of the side effects that you feel, such as fatigue, uh, swelling in your legs, or even insomnia, could be side effects of your common medications that you take for blood pressure, cholesterol, and even diabetes. Dietary history becomes very important because what you eat day in, day out, three meals a day plus a couple snacks, can play a huge role in how you absorb your medic medications, uh, how, you have, how your energy level uh, is affected, and even your sleep as well. Family history, very important. If someone comes in uh, being overweight, uh, part of the reason is not, well, majority of reasons could very well be lifestyle and your environment, but what, what kind of environment you grew up in and how you're genetically predisposed uh, from your mom and dad becomes a risk factor as well. If you have one parent who is overweight or obese, your chance of being overweight, uh, overweight or obese becomes 50%. And if both of your parents were obese or overweight, your chance is increased to about 80%. So it's always nice to know what the genetic predisposition is as well. Psychiatric history is very important uh, because most of the issues with depression and anxiety has a correlation with someone and the behavior in how they eat and how they sleep. A lot of my clients who are overweight um, also are on some kind of anti-anxiety anti -anxi anti medications as well as antipsychotics, which have really bad side effects that increases your chance of on overeating, changing in your behavior and what you feel is food that what are foods that you want to eat, um, as well as retaining water. Uh, social history, how many hours do you actually spend in front of the TV or in front of the computer working? Uh, do you have dogs? Do you walk your dogs? Are your dogs overweight? These become very important information as well. Uh, ob gyne history. If someone comes in who have had normal periods, uh, all their lives and then all of a sudden stop having periods or started having really heavy periods, that could also indicate uh, some kind of weight problem as well. Work history, uh, we, we think about, well, what do you do at work? Do you sit eight to 10 hours a day in front of a computer or are you active, running around, being active, even though you don't have a gym uh, regimen? That could very well play a role in how you gain weight or how you slowly gain weight. Uh, the stuff on the left really comes under the subjective information, but now that we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, the objective data that we gather 
in the office, which could very well uh, help with the whole diagnosis. Vi vital signs. So when you come in, my, my nurse usually will put you in the room and they'll do your basic blood pressure, uh, pulse, temperature, and calculate your BMI, like I mentioned, with your weight and height. These information are very uh, crucial as well. A lot of times during our first physical exam, I can tease out, a lot of inf uh, tease out a lot of potential problems just looking at your vitals, especially for the fact that most people don't know that they have high blood pressure until it's being measured uh, in a professional setting. And you definitely don't feel high blood pressure symptomatically. It's not something that you'll, you'll get like a headache or dizziness or chest pain. And it's not uh, uncommon to have absolutely no symptoms. So it is very important to go in for your physical for that reason, for us to actually find ways to tease out these potential issues. Uh, baseline EKG is very important as well. If you spend your life not exercising and you decided and one day you wake up and you decide to undergo some kind of aggressive weight loss plan, the last thing you want to do is start exercising without having your heart checked out with an EKG at least, a baseline EKG. Um, that's definitely one reason why you would want an EKG. A second reason why you would want an EKG when you come see me at least would be your interest in starting an appetite suppressant. You know, a lot of my clients are also into, you know, fulfilling or starting a new diet regimen, but they also need a little help on the side, like appetite suppressant. But in doing so, you also need EKG to make sure that you don't have any underlying heart conditions because some of these medications can very well cause problems with arrhythmias. Some of the other things I measure in my office are uh, body composition, and I also go through your f uh, food diary or 24-hour uh, food recall, as well as your exercise history. I'm sh I don't know if most physicians would do this, but um, in my practice, I, this is also very crucial as well. And I will go into details on what all these things are shortly. So otherwise, my visits usually take about 40, 45 to 60 minutes for reasons of understanding exactly what you're going through, what you're feeling, what's going on with your life, and everything, all this information a lot of times play a role in how I make a decision for your plan or a new diet plan or lifestyle change. So body composition, I mentioned earlier, is something that we measure in the office or I measure in the office. I have a machine that basically measures your body, uh, percent body fat, fat weight, lean weight, which is your muscle weight, as well as your resting metabolism, your active, active metabolism. Resting metabolism is basically the calories that you burn at rest. If you were sitting around all day long doing absolutely nothing, you have a number of calories that you would burn. Whereas if you incorporate some kind of active or activity, either through just physical activity, like cleaning your house, washing your car, versus going to 24 hour fitness five days a week, that could very well bump your resting metabolism up to a certain number as well. So you really have two different metabolism. And finally, the machine also tells you the percent water, which is helpful to see if you're dehydrated or not. Different technology that actually measure these things comes down to the list seen on the right side here. Um, we all know that back in high school, we, we undergo the skin caliper or the little pinch behind the arms. That's definitely one cheap way in doing it. Um, not super accurate, but good enough for the setting of like high school or middle school. Bioimpedance is another uh, way on measuring your body composition and basically it's a portable machine that you can that I have in my office where we use this to electrons from two different distance um, and using the percent water and electrons in the density of your muscle versus your fat to calculate all the things that I mentioned here on the left side as well. But gold standard really comes down to air displacement as well as water displacement, meaning I put you in your swimsuit, I dunk you in a pool, and then I measure the percent water that you displace in a pool setting. But of course, that's unrealistic, and no one really wants to get in a swim, swimming suit, you know, um, at, any time or, at any time or situation. And of course, VO Max, which is another technology, and I will show you with pictures now on what these things are. So we're very, we're probably familiar with this little skin caliber. Uh, I do have this in my office. Um, as well as something that sort of looks like this as well. 
very portable, very convenient, and if anything, it's a great tool to help me help you come up with a plan that works for you and your body type. Uh, these things down here are more for research. So when I was doing research back at UCLA, these were some of the technology and machines that we used to do a lot of metabolic studies. But otherwise, you'll see most of these things up here uh, or more commonly in the community when you go to health fairs and what they sell at the store as well. So now what? Um, you sat down with me for an hour and I'm telling you you're overweight. We all know this. That's why you're here to see me. So. Um, the next thing to think about really comes down to a few options here, listed here. A lot of people would go straight to the com uh, commercial com uh, companies, you know, such as whatever they find online. You just Google, you Google weight loss um, in, a, in wherever you live, like in LA, um, and a lot of stuff will pop up. And I will go over in the next slide on what those things are. Uh, other things that are also available to you are medical weight loss as well as surgical and bariatric management. Just depending on, it really comes down to how overweight and how obese you are, because each of these different things have different indication on what you can and cannot do. So I'm gonna start off with the basic weight management plans, or at least with the commercial weight loss plans that we, are, that we heard about or we are familiar with. Stuff that you see online, once you Google weight loss or dieting. Um, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, Zone, Paleo, Nutrisystem, South Beach, Atkins, the raw food diet, the Dr. Oz diet. These are all very common things that you would find online. And the best thing about these things are that it's easy to access. You can <laughs> sign on as a member online. There's usually some kind of meeting places or a clinic that you can go to. And most of these places are chains um, and corporate. So it means that in every city, there's a couple places that you can go to. So it's easy to get to and, um, and they sell food, they sell products, they sell plans and you sign on with the memberships and then you're connected with basically a community. Who, who here has been in any of these diet plans? Exactly, very common. And most of, the pe most of the clients that I see in my practice have already tried at least two or three of these companies before they come see me for medical weight loss um, for a very obvious reason. These are things that are easy to access and easy to get to and relatively cheap too. So then next, let's just say most of these plans fail for whatever reason. You do it for six months, it worked for, it worked for a while, you lose about 30 to 40 pounds, now what? Then the next step up option would be what we call medical weight loss. And then a lot of the institutions around LA uh, have their own components of medical weight loss, such as you know, UCLA, Cedars, USC has one too. Um, other private clinics, a lot of the private clinics in, in town here in Thousand Oaks are notorious for having some kind of wellness center, some diet centers or nutrition centers that they incorporate into their own existing practice. Um, there's also a company called Center for Medical Weight Loss, where it's actually originally from New York. And you, as physicians, we can actually learn the whole process of medical weight loss by signing on and learning the process in itself. Um, it's just an add-on company that you can add on to your existing practice as well. Of course, Cedars, uh, Huntington, everyone has their own program. But in all reality, all these programs sort of have the same philosophy. We use the idea of high lean proteins, low refined carbs, and high fiber as a way in helping you lose weight. We can provide some kind of protein replacement, and we can even drive the calories as low as 500 to 600 calories a day. But in doing so, um, it is medically monitored, meaning you have to come see me once a week to make sure that I don't put you in dehydration or some kind of arrhythmia and give you a heart attack and kill you in this process. Um, but the fact is, you are medically monitored. We do get your blood work, EKG, and we do your vitals almost on a weekly basis. And the idea here is low calorie, high protein. We give you all the proteins that you need to fit your body type, so we're not starving your body in any way or form. What we're driving down are your calories from your carbohydrates. So this is just a different way on losing a bunch of weight without having to undergo surgery um, and what we call more aggressive medical weight management. 
And of course, the best thing about this plan is that uh, you are offered appetite suppressants, and they do work. Um, I'm gonna, I have a couple of slides towards the end on specifically what's out in the community and what we write for, um, or even your, what your primary cares can offer as well. And again, uh, medical weight loss has uh, the component of basically a team of people that includes MD, RDs, nurse practitioners, dietitians, and psychotherapists that can help you along the way with successful weight loss. And that's PA for physician assistants. And just a little bit about our uh, risk factor obesity clinic, in which we are opening our second site in the Thousand Oaks uh, office as well. And I would be one of the main physicians that will be running the program um, at, in Thousand Oaks. But otherwise, our first clinic is in Westwood. So Nutrition 101, I definitely need to spend a few slides or at least a portion of my talk on the whole idea on nutrition. I think that's what we're here for as well, to just learn a little bit about something when it comes to basic nutrition. So I'm going to start off with this slide here, where nutrition really comes down to three main things. Your carbs, your proteins, and your fats. And that's what we think about all the time. We always think about carbohydrates and how we should cut down on it, all the sugars that we should and shouldn't be eating. Um, we, we hear from you know, what we see on TV, what we hear on the radio, even our own friends tell us, oh, you shouldn't be eating this because of that, and you have diabetes, and you shouldn't be eating fruits. But there's so much information you know, that, you get, that you are exposed to. But the fact is, there are basic knowledge that you need to just understand. And then from there on, you can make your own decisions in a lot of whatever information that you're exposed to. So carbohydrates, uh, basic carbohydrates, basically comes down to two things. You got your complex and your refined carbs. And a lot of my clients always mix these two things up together. Once they think they can't eat carbs, they just stop eating carbs altogether. So they, eat, they stop eating the bread, the pasta, the noodles, the rice. They also stop eating their bananas, the pears, the apples, because it's sugar, it's sweet. So it's carbs, and I don't want to eat that anymore. But obviously, that's not true. Um, but you have to think about carbs in really two components. Complex carbs, which are your fruits and vegetables, and your simple carbs, which are your refined carbs like bread, pasta, noodles, and anything that come out of a bag. Proteins are the second macronutrients, or what we, basically these three components are what we call macronutrients. The second macronutrients are proteins. These could be obtained by animals versus vegetables as well. There are different types of things that we want to think about when it comes to proteins and amino acids. I'm going to spend a couple slides talking about that too. Fats, good fats, bad fats. Um, there are definitely more certain fats that we should focus on versus other fats that we shouldn't focus on. But first, of all, let's get started with carbohydrates. I mentioned a little bit about refined carbs versus complex carbohydrates. So the stuff on the left, basically, are your refined stuff. Anything that has been processed or made into this kind of form, a cookie or donut, uh, sodas, fruit juices, are all considered to be refined carbohydrates. We call it refined because it has been processed. It has been created in a way where we no longer have to process this in our body. So the moment we eat it, in the first hour of time after ingesting these types of refined carbohydrates, our sugar goes through this high spike. And that's why we get that burst of energy that we get when we go for that cookie or that sip of Coke. We get that surge of sugar, that instant high. Whereas on the other hand, we, uh, complex carbohydrates are basically things with lots of fiber. And it could be our fruits, our vegetables, or our wheat products, our wheat cereal, our kashigo lean cereals in the morning, or a bran muffin. These are all considered to be complex carbohydrates. And these things are good for us. Um, even though, yes, it was created, it went through a machine, and um, even though it's processed, but compared to what we see here on this side of this slide, it's considered to be complex because of the fiber. So the next big thing, really, when it comes to dieting, comes down to the fact that you've got to incorporate the fiber into your day, because the fiber would really help you stabilize that sugar load, and it forces your body to basically not absorb. It slows down the absorption of sugar in a way where you get only a little bit of the sugar absorbed into your bloodstream, a little bit at a time, which then benefits for, well, the fact is then you don't get that one high spike an hour after you eat, 
and you, don't also, you also don't get that very low dip right after you eat. So eating lots of complex carbs would definitely benefit people with sugar problems or diabetics because now their sugar is always stable at one level. I threw a nutrition facts label up here because I want to, I want to sort of uh, incorporate the whole idea of label reading. It's very important and it has a lot of information that we oftentimes don't think about. Um, the fact is, every time we look at the label, we go straight for the calories. We look at the calories and then perhaps we look at the fat content. But what does it really mean? What, what does all these things up here mean? So first of all, make sure when you read the label, the calories that you see on the facts, it's, ca it's the calories per one serving. So depending on how many serving, let's just say this Kashi Golin box, how many servings are there in this box? Then you're gonna look up here, there's actually 10 servings in this box. So really, if you sat down and ate this whole box of cereal, it's 120 calories times 10, which is 1200 calories. Obviously no one's gonna do that, but a lot of times there are a lot of food in little packages where we don't think about. Visually to us, it looks like a one serving package, but in reality, there's actually about two and a half servings. So people, you know, a lot of times we, we get confused and we end up eating way more calories than we anticipate for reasons of not understanding that this is per one serving of calories. Then we look at total carbohydrates. Um, I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of uh, patients and clients who come to me and they tell me, you know what, this Golin, this Kashi Golin cereal has really high carbs, so I don't want to eat it for reasons of because this carb here is 26, 29 grams of carbs per serving. But what you need to look at also is the amount of fiber that's actually in that serving as well as the amount of protein that's also in that serving and I'm totally blind, I can't see that close. But um, this protein here is actually five grams of protein per serving of the cereal, and the fiber is actually 10 grams of fiber per serving. So these two numbers actually cancels out the total carbohydrates, and it's as simple as addition. Total carbohydrate that you see there as 29 minus the total fiber, which is 10. So really, the, the total, if you took the difference of your total carb to the total fiber, and the difference comes down to about 19. This is still considered a high carb food, but compared to what you thought before, it's no longer a, a 29 grams of carb type food. It's actually 19. But if you truly are looking out for the low carb food in the market, here's, here's really the cutoff. When you take total, total carbohydrates, minus your total protein, and if the difference come out higher than 10, then it's considered to be a high carb food. But anything below 10 is considered to be a low carb food. So this is sort of like a fun, quick trick that you can sort of determine if something is high carb or low carb when you're at the aisle trying to pick out your foods that's in a box form. Protein, a couple more labels. The recommendation for uh, normal protein intake comes down to 0.5 to 0.8 grams per kilograms of weight. So you have to change your weight in pounds into kilograms first before you can calculate what you personally eat. So if you're 180 pounds, yes? On the previous uh, screen, mm -hmm. why do you say fiber powder? Oh, fiber powder. Um, because you can actually Fiber powders such as Metamucil or Citrusel, these are very common powders that you find at the stores. You can supplement that to add on to your day. You know, a lot, a lot of times uh, our patients and our clients just don't have the time to make fruits and vegetables or prepare salads consistently. You can always use fiber powder as your source of, as your source of fiber as well. So proteins, like I mentioned, this is really the recommended uh, proportion, 0.5 to 0.8 grams per kilograms of your body weight. So if you have your pounds, if you're 180 pounds, per se, divide that by 2.2, that then will convert to your kilogram. So 2.2 is your conversion factor. The number that you end up with would be your kilograms, and you multiply it by 0.5 or 0.8, or somewhere in between, or 0.75 if you want. The number that you end up with is the grams of protein that you need just to sustain, or that's enough for your body type and your weight. 
okay? Uh, lean proteins come down, I mean, basically are your, the stuff that, it's not red meat. Uh, these types of proteins have the least saturated fats. It's like your yogurt, your cottage cheese, chicken breast, fish, seafood, tofu, legumes are considered to be lean proteins. Um, and some of the more exotic foods like ostrich and buffalo meat. Buffalo meat, surprisingly, uh, tastes like beef, but it's leaner than a piece of chicken breast. So um, if you guys can get your hands on good buffalo meat, that's definitely a better way to go. And of course, egg whites, which I didn't write up here, but egg whites is definitely lean protein as well. Yes? Is full fat cottage cheese okay as opposed to low fat? It is okay. It is okay because it's, it's milk fat. Um, it's not saturated fat. It, I mean, there's portion of it that is saturated, but the fact is if you're going to put yourself on a diet such as this with high fiber and low with fine carbs, you can afford to have the fat from your dairy. So I, never, I tell my clients not to shy away from full fat versions of anything, like whole milk versus uh, yogurts versus non-fat. Because non-fat a lot of times it just uh, contains more sugar as a filler. So. Plus, I, I seem to get hungrier faster when I do non-fat. Exactly. And I'll buy the non-fat cottage cheese. It sits in my refrigerator and I throw it out. I can't eat it. <laughs> right, right. And fats in general actually slows down your gastric emptying time. So it means it keeps you fuller longer. But of course, we don't want you to be eating whole fat with anything all the time. It comes down to moderation as well. So definitely don't shy away from the, from the whole milk and the regular fat yogurt as part of your diet. Um, again, I got two nutrition facts labels up here uh, for reasons of one is a low carb food and one's a high carb food. So as you can see here, um, well, they're both kind of high carb, but I don't even know what kind of food that, what kind of food item that these two labels are from. But you can see that when you look at the calories and the carbs and the proteins, these are the things I want you to start looking at. Because for this product here, I don't really need to know what this food item is per se, but you know that this is a better alternative than whatever you have here, only because at 200 calories, your total carb, yes, is 36 grams. It means the sugar that's made up of the carbohydrate is pretty high. But look at the dietary fiber. There's 11 grams of fiber as well as 13 grams of protein. So whatever this product is, has the two things that we always talk about, fiber and protein, which adds on to you feeling full and the fiber helps you move things along, as well as the protein that provides all the amino acids that you need to, for your muscles and your cells. Whereas this product here, at 155 calories per serving, your total carb is 14, but your fiber is only one gram and your protein is only two grams. So in our reality, I don't know what this is, it's still a high sugar food because the calories correlates with the fact that there is no protein and there's no fiber. So most of the calories from this product on the right side are straight from sugar, whereas the calories on the left side is actually from your fiber and your protein. So these are just a little quick, easy way on. Even on though it says the sugar higher on the one on the mm -hmm, left, mm -hmm, and yeah. on the right it says yeah, I have a feeling that this, this product here, it's a uh, diet product with really nothing in it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it comes down to, well, your body needs sugar, you know, but it has nothing in it. There's no protein, no fiber. It's just straight sugar. And your body can process this. Uh, the, the label on the left, the fact is with all that fiber and all that protein, you're, not gonna, you're gonna end up pushing a lot of things out and not absorbing the sugars and the carbs. So again, uh, I think some of you are trying to calculate how much protein you need, and this is just another way I'm looking at it. Uh, again, if you're 170 pounds, you convert that to kilograms by dividing it by 2.2. So this individual here at 77 kilograms wants maximum protein per day. Multiply that by 0.8 and they get 62. 62 is now your grams of protein that you need per day. And one example is one cup of Yoplait, the little containers that you buy for $1.50 at the store, usually has about 14 grams of protein. So you can very well add up how many Yoplates would I need to fulfill the calories or the grams of protein that I need. So it's about three, which is pretty good, three or four, four really.
Now fat. Uh, under guidelines, our, our national uh, guidelines basically comes down to the fact that we want to eat fat but not too much fat and not too much of the bad fats and we want to focus more on the good fats. So recommendation is that we should be consuming less than 25% of our calories from fat. So what is 25% what is of our calories? On national average, the government thinks that we should be eating about 2,000 calories a day. That's the average. But realistically, likely, we're probably eating more than 2,000 calories, especially if you're slowly gaining weight, likely you're eating way more. So assuming that you're eating 2,000 calorie, 2, calories per day, 25% should be from fat calories, meaning about 500 calories of the 2,000 should be from fat. Now within that, they only want you to commit only 7% of that 25% on saturated fats, meaning egg yolks, red meat, like beef, pork, lamb, anything red basically. And of course trans fats comes down to the oils that you use to make the donuts or the fried chicken or the french fries, the potato chips and things like that. They, they just want you to eat as little as possible. Cholesterol, the recommendation for uh, cholesterol intake is about 300 milligrams per day. One egg yolk has about 140 milligrams. So you can imagine, you probably shouldn't be eating egg yolks every day in every meal. The good fats that we always want to uh, focus on comes down to monounsaturated fats as well as polyunsaturated fats, what we would call MUFA and PUFAs, um, omega-3s and omega-6. Omega-3s are the things that we talk about all the time when it comes to fish oils. And if you can't eat fish for whatever reason, or you just don't like the taste of fish or the fish capsules that you buy at the store because of the aftertaste, you can also obtain omega-3 from uh, vegetarian choices, such as flaxseed, uh, chia seed, as well as walnuts, walnut oil, and even whole walnuts. Omega-6, uh, there's basically three types of omegas. There's omega-3, 6, and 9. Uh, the higher the number of the omega, the, the worse on the list. So the ones that you want to focus on comes down to omega-3. Omega-3 is better. Where's my little pointer? Uh, omega-3 is better than omega-6. 6 is better than 9. And olive oil, surprisingly, has actually much more omega-6 than omega-3. You got it. A couple of the oils that I always uh, that I promote and focus on comes down to um, olive oil as well as grapeseed oil. Um, some, one interesting thing about olive oil is that we use it in everything we, we eat. You know, we eat it raw, we eat it cooked. But the fact is, when you cook olive oil oil at high temperature, like frying temperature, it changes the configuration to more of the omega six and omega nine. So it's always a good idea to eat your olive oil uncooked. And on the other hand, if you choose to cook and you cook a lot, you can always use grapeseed oil, which can tolerate a higher cooking temperature. Oh, oh, that's true, that's true, yeah. No problem. Okay. All right. I think the battery died on that, that's probably what happened. Oh, that's okay, I can, I can. Do both, that's not a problem, thank you. Okay, the last part of the talk, I wanna focus on medications. You know, I get a lot of questions on medications itself on, yes. How about canola oil? Canola is good too, it's, it's for, still. Uh, for, like, for cooking, frying, yep. It's okay? Mm -hmm. What is the omega, what is For canola oil, there's, uh, there's omega-6, and there's some oh. omega-3, like tiny portions of omega-3. But if you really want to focus on omega-3, you, you got to use the grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil, yes. yeah. There's some omega-3 in olive oil, but just not as much as grapeseed oil. And if you want to go crazy, exotic, you can focus on walnut oil. I don't, know, I don't know how much they charge for that. I can imagine it's probably really expensive. But, yeah. So medications. Uh, I get a lot of questions on medications. And it is interesting because uh, we hear a lot about fen, -fen. Have, have anyone here in this room used FenFen? And it works. It, it's actually a really good medication, you know. Um, the fact was, uh, it, there were a portion of people, which 
it's not that many really in reality that actually suffered from some kind of heart valve or conditions because of the side effects of fenfen. Um, when it comes down to it, I think it's more of bad screening. If someone has underlying heart conditions, then they shouldn't be started on fenfen. But the fact was there were a few people that actually had and developed uh, arrhythmias and valvular conditions because of it and died from it. So it got pulled off the market back in 1990. But otherwise, a lot more people have benefited from FemFen itself. So along the way, what they did was they went ahead and took out, basically FemFen is two medications in one, uh, which is called Femfluoramine and Fentramine. Uh, what they did was they took out Fentramine and kept, kept on marketing the Fentramine portion of the FemFen. Fentramine it has been around for many years, uh, even back in the 80s. And it does work in the brain, in the appetite suppression center in the brain where we, we have cravings. It works at the neural uh, transmitters in the norepinephrine molecule in the brain. It causes us to feel that sensation of our, our appetite being suppressed. So people oftentimes don't feel like they want to eat after they take their doses of phentermine. At the same time, it's also a stimulant. So a lot of my clients would get the surge of energy, if anything, from taking these types of medications. Uh, low abuse potential, people don't get addicted to fentramine, and you don't have to be titrated off in any way or form. And it is offered at different doses, and even your primary care physicians can write for this if you really need it. Some of the things that you obviously don't uh, want to have while taking this medication is some kind of underlying heart condition, number one, and your physician should be asking you all these questions, as well as thyroid conditions. But otherwise, this is a short-term medication, meaning you can only be on it for about three months, and that's it. You can't be on it for years and years, even though I do have clients who I watch very closely who are on these medications for years and years for reasons of the, the side effects, which is a stimulation that they like, and not so much for the appetite suppression portion of the medication. Other things in the market, the over-the-counter uh, Ally. Uh, are anyone here familiar with Ally over-the-counter? The little the medication where uh, they sell at the pharmacy nowadays. Basically, that medication uh, prevents you from absorbing fat in your gut. So when you take it and you eat a meal with lots of fat, that medication is able to decrease the absorption. So your bloodstream and your body actually doesn't see the fat as it would if you didn't take the medication. Um, it comes in a low dose at the store uh, at, at 60 milligrams three times a day, and that's what we call Ally. This is stuff you don't need a prescription for at a low dose. But let's just say you, you find a lot of benefit from Ally, and you feel like you just need that extra increase or even doubling of the dose, and you talk to your physician about it, physician can increase that to double the amount to uh, Zenical, which is 120 milligrams three times a day. But some, some of the uh, potential side effects when it comes to Ally and Zenical is what we call fecal leakage, because if you're not absorbing your fat, it gotta come out somewhere. And sometimes people lose control because they can't get to the bathroom quick enough. So a lot of times that's a deterrent when it comes to choosing the right medication for you. Topamax uh, is a anti-migraine headache medication that we use for migraines and sometimes seizures or even depression. But the side effects for Topamax is appetite suppression. So some, some physicians and myself, we, we could and we do use that side effects as a way on helping you control your appetite. And of course, it does require that you come back and be monitored while you're on this medication. The dose here is the same as um, someone with a migraine headache, who has migraine headaches, and for that indication. Two of the new medication that just came out back in June and July of uh, 2012, uh, is something called Kismia, as well as Locasterin. Locasterin is interesting because it is similar to Fenfen. Um, this, what we call serotonin 3C agonist, uh, it's basically a receptor in the brain that this medication is now hitting. Uh, whereas fenfluramine from fenfen was an older version of this medication that not only did it hit the brain, but it also hit the heart. And that was the issue with the whole fenfen fiasco. But now these companies have basically isolated the one molecule that works specifically in the brain. And if you actually start at very low dose, you can really 
uh, experience the, the, whole, the whole indication of, um, of appetite suppression, just like fenfluramine from back in the day. And it is FDA approved, so your physician can very right for this medication as well. Kismaria is a combination pill, basically combination of two old medication that's been around in the market for many of years. If anything, you have to come, you have to start at a low dose at 3.75 slash 23, 3.75 of fentamine, I should have flipped flop that around, 3.75 of fentamine and 23 milligrams of topomax, and you increase it to a maximum 15 fentamine and 92 of the topomax for the same idea for appetite suppression. It doesn't increase your metabolism in any way or form. A lot of, question, uh, a lot of people would ask me really the, same, the one question, does these appetite suppressants increase my metabolism? No, it does not. It only controls what you feel about food in general. So. Um, do you really need it for weight loss? No. Can it help you in weight loss? Yes. But once you're off it, you may revert back into how you feel about food, you know, even with binging behaviors or, you know, the time, usually the time when people have a lot of problems with binge eating or eating too many calories, it's right after work and right before dinner. You come home from a long, hard day of work, that's the hour when you want to really eat whatever you find at home. And this medication, these types of appetite suppression can help you get over the hump or get over those few hours of your day that causes you to overeat. So now, besides medication and medical weight loss or even commercial weight loss plans, um, the most aggressive form of weight loss therapy is bariatric surgery. And there's a, there's a few techniques out there um, that has been around for years, and I'm gonna go through each of them uh, quickly. If anything, there's just lots of pictures. But the indication for bariatric surgery comes down to these few things. The criteria are pretty lax. It's not like you have to go through 80 different things to be qualified for weight loss surgery. First thing first, BMI, the body mass index. If your body mass index is over 40, there's an automatic indication that you are, that you can undergo some kind of surgical weight loss plan. But let's just say your BMI is not 40, it's not over 40, maybe it's 37.5. If that's the case, then you have to present or at least show your insurance company that you have some kind of comorbid condition um, along with a, a heavy weight for surgical weight loss. So these comorbid conditions are diabetes, high blood pressure, joint pain, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, or anything that could be related to your weight gain. You also have to show that you failed some kind of conservative treatment, meaning you have tried Jenny Craig Weight Watchers and maybe Lindora. You went to UCLA and did two years of medical weight loss. Nothing helped. This is sort of your last resort. So your insurance company has to look at all these things as well. And you have to show that you have a very good understanding of what surgical weight loss really means, what you have to undergo, what kind of psychological evaluation you have to go through, what kind of, uh, what kind of workup you have to uh, endure, such as colonoscopies, blood work, um, multiple visits to the surgeon to really understand what you're getting yourself into. But once you show all this, you're then usually approved by your company, your insurance company. Uh, one of the three modalities really comes down to the first one here. This is the most common surgical modality when it comes to uh, surgical weight loss. This is the laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, or what we also know as lap band. Lap band is the brand name for this procedure. But there's definitely other uh, companies out there that are creating techniques and, and technology similar to the lap band. Basically, this is a, uh, a purely restrictive modality, meaning we put a little inert silicone ring around your stomach to recreate this little pouch where you no longer can eat the amount of food that you were eating before. Um, there's no malabsorption in any way or form. If anything, you just have a smaller stomach above your existing stomach. And the amount of food that you now can eat comes down to about two to three tablespoons at a time. So now you have to eat more frequent, eat small portions, and really pick and choose what you're capable of eating. Uh, you, uh, like I said, uh, when it comes to restriction, it just means you have to eat less calories at, in moderation and maybe increased frequency of what you can eat. Um, doing this, there is an effect on the stomach in itself. 
if you're no longer using this big portion of your stomach, some of the receptors in the stomach here, which causes you to feel hungry or digestion, are now no longer activated. So having a lap band, a lot of times my clients would have a natural appetite suppression, a suppressive uh, uh, feeling or a sensation after having a lap band done. And overall, the complication rate for a lap band is very, it's very low. Um, if you can't tolerate the banding for any reason, you can always just take the ring off. You can go back in laparoscopically and just take it out. So it's as easy as that. Next modality is called a gastric bypass. Also very common. Actually started out in Europe and everyone's doing it and then it got brought onto the US. And you know, it's a good, it's a good procedure only be for reasons of not only are we causing restriction in your stomach, but we're also causing this malabsorption portion of the whole regimen itself. So basically what we're doing is we, we are pulling the small bowel up to the proximal portion of your stomach. And then we go ahead, we went ahead and just cut off your big portion of your stomach off, sewed it up. We leave everything as is. If anything, we tack it into your abdomen wall. So you still have your your greater curvature of your stomach still in your abdomen. We don't take anything out. All we're doing is separating that, recreate a smaller space, and doing a little uh, readjusting of your gut by pulling up a small bowel to attach to your stomach. So basically your stomach is now this big, and all the food that you end up eating gets dumped into your lower end of your small bowel. So not only are you restricting food, you are now restricting the stuff that you can eat. If you ate a lot of sugars for whatever reason, the sugar gets dumped into this, this small bowel portion and then it gets processed into your lower portion of your small bowel. If you eat too much sugar, then you, you put yourself in something called dumping syndrome. These are the side effects on processing way too much sugar at too little time. This becomes an adverse reaction where you actually learn as a negative reinforcement. If I eat too much sugar, I go into dumping sy syndrome, meaning nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. If I keep doing this, it's going to hurt every time I eat. So therefore, I am going to learn not to do that again. So, and that makes sense. It's a little bit aggressive, um, but when you're desperate enough to undergo some kind of surgical weight loss modality, a lot of times these clients are very compliant. What happens to the stomach that's left in there? Yeah, it's just, it shrinks in size, but it stays right in your abdomen. We don't remove anything. But the fact is you can also reverse this. Let's just say for some reason you have chronic leakage or there's some kind of infection that won't heal. The surgeon can actually go in and reattach the stomach. But you gotta realize every time you cut open anything in the abdomen, you're creating scar tissue. So your stomach may not function the way it was before if you go back and readjust it and reconnect everything. And you're gonna create a lot more scar tissue that you didn't have before. So a lot of my clients would have a lot of chronic pain, um, bloating, because it's just not working like it was before. So it's not a good idea to go in and reverse a gastric bypass, but not impossible. But having these two different components in surgical weight loss, you do lose a lot of weight. People can lose up to 10 pounds a week after having this kind of bypass uh, um, uh, surgery. But there's definitely more complications as well as possible side effects. If you lose too much weight too quickly, you can also develop gallstones. You can also uh, develop malabsorptions. Some of the fats that you're supposed to absorb no longer have the time to be absorbed and you become deficient in fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Um, sometimes uh, rerouting your gut you, uh, they, they, they either uh, reroute it too early into the small bowel versus too late in the small bowel. You can create little pockets of infections and bacterial overgrowth where you have to be on chronic uh, antibiotic for the rest of your life. It just all depends on how your surgeon is. And that's why the surgery centers that actually employ these bariatric surgeons are really super strict. You have to have done so many cases, you have to be accredited by Medicare, and you have to show that you're competent in doing these type of procedures. Because once you screw up, this is a, it's a huge deal. And so, I mean, I personally don't promote any of my clients to undergo this kind of weight loss modality, because I feel like once you have the mindset and the motivation and the control, you don't need to subject yourself to something so invasive. And I think this is really beyond um, 
invasiveness when it comes to weight loss. But of course, um, it's not for all patients either. A lot of, you gotta remember that a lot of my overweight patients also have a lot of medical conditions. You can actually be too much or be too obese to have the surgery. Your BMI cannot be over 50 or else you're just too big for the surgery. So your insurance company likely will force you to go into some kind of medical weight loss plan, lose a bunch of weight, then undergo this surgery to, for you to lose a little more weight. Uh, the last one here is more, uh, it's becoming popular. You might hear more about it now in the community, uh, which is called gastric sleeve. All they're doing is they just go, they go in and, and cut off the greater portion of your stomach, leaving your stomach in fully attacked form, except now it's not that big. It's, it's much more narrow. Now it's just one tube versus a big curvature. Again, you're cutting off portions of your stomach that has receptors that causes hunger, and um, that very well can cause appetite suppression as well. And again, the volume at which you're left with comes down to about 60 to 100 cc's volume of food that you can now eat. But everything goes through the same curvature. It gets absorbed in the small bowel and so on. So uh, this is definitely the, the next big surgical intervention that a lot of people are undergoing for weight loss. Sometimes you see people have gone through surgeries, I don't know what kind, mm -hmm. but they still put on weight. Right, the rate, weight regain is very high, specifically for gastric banding or the lap band versus gastric bypass. You know, this is more like the point of no return. Once you have this, you're kind of stuck and you have to eat the way you eat for, for months and months. So the success rate for this, once you actually follow a good plan, it's really high. You lose a lot of weight and a lot of people do end up kicking off their diabetes and their high blood pressure and all these other things that they were taking medications for. They can literally stop taking medications because of this procedure. Whereas the lap banding here has a high failure rate because of the fact that you can restretch that stomach back to the original size if you overeat. But the fact is you can also take this ring out as easy as just going back in. Have you heard of something you eat and it blows up in your stomach to fill you up? Yes. What is that called? Uh, I forget the, 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 uh, the medical term for it. It's, um, it's basically a, it's a stomach balloon. Is it effective? It could be effective. It's sort of, it's sort of similar to this, to this uh, procedure, except you don't go in and cut off anything. It's just a, it's a sort of like a probe, or you can actually insert it endoscopically. You put it in your stomach, you blow up, and it creates half the lumen size for the same reason. You keep it there all the time? You keep it there all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like uh, there are patients with cardiac conditions where they can't pump their heart. It's called intracardiac balloon, ballooning. Uh, same idea, you put a little balloon into the heart and you help it pump. Whereas in the stomach, you just keep it from being its original size. So you can only eat so much volume. And nowadays, there's another diet regimen where they put a uh, uh, feeding tube into your through your nose into the stomach and you walk around with a feeding tube and you feed yourself only a certain number of calories um, throughout the day it's it was in Hollywood yeah it was totally a Beverly Hills thing kind of thing <laughs> but you know there's different extremes and um, you know when it comes to weight loss we are always looking for the next big thing it becomes a little bit more either crazy exotic or aggressive it's just how you tolerate and what you tolerate at the end of the day. This is also another, another modality where they go switching things around and we call it the duodenal switch. It's a, actually a offshoot of the gastric bypass. Again, we're rerouting all your gut, all your small bowel into the stomach and, and cutting away portions of your stomach to create a smaller lumen space. Um, again, you get about four to eight ounces of food once you have these procedures at a time and you really have to learn how to eat or else you're gonna end up uh, not absorbing the food that you're supposed to absorb and getting the complications such as nausea, vomiting, and all kinds of good stuff. But otherwise, I'm gonna end the talk with exercise and physical activity. You definitely don't need to have a gym membership to live a healthy life. If anything, physical activity, which is basically the stuff that you do normally every day, going to work, walking to the park, walking your dog, just playing with your kids for an hour a day, are all considered to be physical activities. Washing your car, um, doing the dishes, cleaning your house is all considered to be physical activities. Whereas exercise is a controlled 
uh, regimen that you give yourself by signing on with the gym and going to the gym four or five times a week uh, every day or, or every other day. But the recommendation really comes down to this. Uh, what's, what's a lot of exercise and what's not a lot of exercise? Minimally, recommendation comes down to uh, moderate activity at 150 minutes per week. So if there's, let's just say you just want to work out six days of the week, you divide that 150 by six. Or if you want to do five days a week, you divide 150 by five, which is about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, which is not, you know, it's not that many minutes of your day. Um, a moderate exercise meaning walking at two to three miles speed per hour. You know, just speed walking in general is considered to be moderate exercise. Or you can uh, be super aggressive and do 75 minutes in a week and do the intensive aggressive uh, level of exercise, meaning about four to five miles at a time, running, jogging uh, at that level five days a week. Prevention of weight gain versus prevention of weight regain. Um, if you truly just want to, let's just say you, you lost 30 pounds and you really don't want to regain that weight, then you really have to work a little bit extra hard to keep that weight off by doing about 200 to 300 minutes of workout in a week versus prevention of weight gain in general. Let's just say you never had a weight problem, you didn't fluctuate in your weight at all. 150 to 250 is the recommendation. But if, at the end of the day, it, really is dependent on your body size, what you're starting with, and what your capacity is. So if you're used to doing yoga all the time and every day just that's all you did, then likely it would be, might be hard for you to do 200, 300 minutes of moderate level of exercise. Um, but again, like I mentioned, it comes down to the combination of things. If you are very active throughout the day, you really don't need an exercise regimen and vice versa. Okay. All right, so that's my information, that's my email, and uh, I definitely would send this copy to the YMCA as well, so you guys can have a copy if needed. Yes? My question is, to prevent osteoporosis, mm -hmm. is it true that it's better to be a little heavier in fat than thinner? Could you explain that? Yes, um, most uh, overweight or obese patients actually have lower risk, risk for developing osteopenia and osteoporosis because of the fact that they're naturally weight-bearing every day of their own body weight. But the risks and benefits for that is that you could very well have di diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attack, and cancer versus preventing osteoporosis. So I definitely don't recommend you know, gaining 40 pounds just to keep your bones healthy, but it is true. It is a true uh, phenomenon that heavier people are less likely to have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Well, it comes down to the BMI. You know, they, they calculate the BMI for you, which is a national average for your average Caucasian female versus male. So if you're within that number, you're set, you're good. Anything over 25, so basically in a normal BMI, like I mentioned, is 18 to 25.5, 25.9. Anything over 25.9, which is 26, um, you, it's been shown that you're at risk for metabolic conditions. But I'm not saying that every person with a BMI of 26 has diabetes, and every di diabetic is within the BMI of 18 to 25. So it just depends. Would you say it's better to just get your percentage of fat versus the BMI for your true? That's why body composition is very important. The machine that I was showing where I measure your percent body fat, your muscle mass, um, and the calories that you burn each day really tells me what you're made up of, which to me at the end of the day is more important than the BMI. Because the BMI only, you know, it really just carve out one portion of people in the world. It doesn't address all the other cultures, all the, you know, the structural makeup of who you are, um, the race, the sex, per se. So. For a postmenopausal woman, what would you say is the percentage of fat that's healthy? Uh, anything under 28% or less. If you're an athlete, it could be as low as 12 to 16%. But minimally, for girls, you have to have 6 to 10% body fat. And for guys, at least 3 to 7% body fat. Let's just say you're a true athlete and you do the Ironman marathons and everything else. You still need some percentage of fat. And those are the numbers I just mentioned. You can never have 0% fat. It would be weird. Yes? the formula for figuring out how much protein we mm -hmm. eat. What happens if we eat more protein? 
uh, if you eat too many grams of protein and you're not utilizing it or you're not yeah, wasting it by eating the fiber, then it will turn into fat. Okay, um, so that's why when you eat high lean protein, when you eat a high portion of protein, always make sure you eat the fiber to keep things moving forward. And if you don't, then you better be utilizing it, meaning weight training and just cardiovascular. So as we age, we also have to think about what kind of exercises are we going to do. You can't do the same regimen all your life. You know, we ha I have runners who just love running. That's all they do. They end up losing way too much muscle mass. Um, whereas I have uh, people who love yoga and Pilates, and that's all they do. But they never get the heart up to the maximum heart rate from cardio. But as we grow older, it really starts in our late 20s when we actually start breaking down our muscle mass. Um, along with the fact that some people develop autoimmune condi conditions, diabetes, cancers that take another hit at our muscle mass. So then our uh, the less muscles that we have, the less calories we burn because the things that's helping us burn all our calories are muscles. So that's why it's important that as we grow older, we got to eat differently as well as exercise differently. You can't always be on a treadmill doing the same thing or on an elliptical doing the same thing. You have to incorporate the weight training as well, which could very well be the rubber banding that we do at physical therapy or the free weights that we can buy at Target. All these things has to be, you know, sort of incorporated into your, into your uh, later on years. Weight training is key. Yes? What if we less protein? Okay. Nothing wrong with less eating less protein. It's just that our body do need it. And that's why a lot of times that when we don't think about our diets as we grow older, we tend to, once we'll, we'll start losing the muscle, like I mentioned. As you grow older, you're gonna lose muscle mass. Um, in our late 20s, our percentage of loss is usually about 1%. As you grow older, that 1% becomes 1.5 to 2%. And that's for a normal, healthy individual. If you have no condition whatsoever, you still lose about one to 2% of muscle mass every year. So remember, that adds up pretty quickly, you know, for the how many pounds of muscles that we do have. And then as you grow older, let's just say some people develop cancers like breast cancer, you undergo chemotherapy, you have diabetes or thyroid conditions. All these things causes more breakdown of your muscle. And it could be as high as six to 7% muscle loss. But if you don't think about it, then realistically, once you start losing the muscle, which also lose, you start losing your metabolism, you're gonna start gaining the weight because most people don't change the way they eat and they don't change the way they exercise. So you're always expending that many calories throughout the day, throughout the months and years, but yet your calorie intake, you know, it's, it's, it's coming up, but your, your muscle mass is coming down. So you're really expending, you're gonna end up expending um, less calories, but you'll be eating the same amount of food. So those little calories each year will add up and it takes about 3,000 calories for one pound of fat to be gained. So even though you're not gonna gain a pound a month, but you'll definitely gain a pound to two pounds a year. And then all of a sudden you're like, I don't know why I'm 10 pounds heavier than I was 10 years ago. It's because of the process of aging. I hate calling my clients old or getting old, but the fact is it is what it is, you know, and I'm constantly fighting this myself. Once I learn about this fact, I'm all about like putting myself on protein, putting in the weights, even though I hate weights, but you have to do what you have to do as you grow older. Is, and um, yeah. Is protein powder a good source of protein? It's, it's very good. If anything, nowadays, the protein powders and protein supplements, it's really the next big thing because of the fact that we're all busy people. You know, I've met a lot of ladies in their 60s who are supposed to be retired who are not retired. You know, we're very active. We're a very active society. And so when we're active, it means we spend less time at home cooking and eating whole foods. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you have the right to go to a fast food joint and grab whatever that you can grab with high calories, high fat, and lots of refined carbs, because then you get yourself in trouble. Remember, less exercise, more running around, more fast food means weight gain. So what you need to do is start thinking about, well, what am I gonna do to supplement my day to get in that 60 to 80 grams of protein that I just calculated from this lecture? How am I gonna put in protein throughout my day where I'm constantly feeding my body and maintaining my muscle mass? Uh, not only am I doing the weight training, but also what I'm putting into my body is gonna be very important. So the protein powders that you see at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, it's there for a reason because People love it. It's easy. It's a low calorie food. And if you eat it consistently, you can actually lose weight and maintain your muscle mass. 
And also the fact is, for every pound that you lose in any weight loss plan, or even if you put yourself on some kind of weight loss regimen, for the one pound that you lose, 70% of that pound should be fat weight, 30% should be muscle weight. And you have to lose a little bit of muscle every time you lose weight. But the fact is the ratio, 70-30, is the best and healthiest ratio that you want to work with. Um, you can also lose weight on the lemonade, cayenne pepper lemonade diet, or the starvation diet, but the fact is that the ratio becomes 50-50. You're gonna lose 50% fat and 50% muscle mass. So that's why protein comes into the picture. It's very important because we wanna keep that ratio 70-30 and not 50-50. What if you have uh, beans as your protein? Beans are, beans are considered to be lean proteins, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the carbohydrates that come along with your legumes and beans have much higher calories compared to your animal protein. So your body breaks it down, it does what it is uh, with beans versus protein from animal. Um, but your body sees more of the sugar from your beans versus the animal protein. And that's why calories when it comes to like lentils and, and kidney beans and things always have, and tofu even, have much higher calories per serving compared to the same ounce of protein from chicken. You can compare 15 grams of uh, bean proteins versus 15 grams of chicken protein, the calories would be very drastically different. Is one not as good for your kidney? No. Um, if you truly have kidney conditions, let's just say you have underlying problems, you're diabetic, you develop kidney problems, then yes, you do have to watch the proteins that you eat. Not for the reason of kid, not for reasons of animal protein causing kidney problems. It's just that protein gets filtrated in your kidneys and it causes your kidneys to work harder to make urine. So that's why uh, a person with uh, some kind of kidney problems, for whatever reason, they should be on a different regimen of protein. But you gotta realize you pee a lot of proteins too when your kidneys aren't functioning right. So if you don't eat the proteins and you're peeing out a bunch of proteins, what you're doing is you're just depleting your whole body of the muscle mass because your, your muscle has to break down one way or the other. So there is a number that you have to eat at when you have kidney problems as well, or even liver problems. That's why I, I do medical nutrition, and I can sit people down with a specific regimen that fits their conditions. Yes? So how do you figure out how much fiber you really need a day? Well, um, in our society, we eat about 10 <coughs> minimally, and probably average, we eat from 10 to 15 grams a day in general. And, um, you know, it could be in forms of fruits, vegetables, or even supplements. But if you really truly want to use fiber as a way to treat conditions such as sugars, your diabetes, and high cholesterol, you can eat as high as 30 grams a day. But you also have to start really slow. You don't want to start tomorrow by eating 30 grams of protein, or uh, sorry, fiber at one sitting, because that's just going to cause gas and a lot of bloating. So what you need to do is titrate up. You know, first of all, I'll sit down and understand how much fiber do I really eat? Let's be realistic. You know, sit down and think about how many cups of broccoli do I really eat? How many um, spoons of Metamucil do I really drink? You know, you add that up. And maybe you actually do eat about 12 to 15 grams of fiber a day. The next day, you're going to up that by 5 grams. Do that for a few days, and then you're going to up another 5 until you get to 30. And 30 really is the magic number. 30 is going to be enough to actually provide if you eat 30 grams of fiber from fruits and vegetables, you can literally provide your body with the multivitamin that you, um, that you usually take. You know, a lot of people have the centrum, the multivitamin that they think they need to get all the vitamins and minerals and trace minerals. But in reality, if you ate 30 grams of fruits and vegetables in fiber form, you don't really need the multivitamin because different fruits and vegetables would provide all that for you. So 30 would be the magic number. That is like how many cups? Of vegetables and fruits. Right. Um, it, it, I mean, obviously, I don't expect you to memorize everything yeah. here. And, um, you know, there are food lists that I give out. There are food lists that you can Google for as well. Literally, you can go and say vegetable list, grams of fiber. I'll tell you exactly how. Exactly. Yes. Uh, does your program accept insurance and such? We do. We do. We take basically all insurance Medicare, PPO, um, and if you're under the UCLA HMO. We obviously, we take that too. So, yeah, if you, don't, if you don't know if your insurance works with our company, all you gotta do is just call the, call the number, or we probably have some time flag. 
Is there a flyer? Do we have flyers? Oh, we have a bunch of flyers back there. There's always a phone number somewhere. Everything but Kaiser, pretty much. Kaiser, we have to go to their facilities. Are you actually a part of the UCLA Medical? Because um, I saw all the stuff out there. Mm -hmm. So you, um, I'm a retiree from UCLA, so I have UCLA insurances. Yes, yes. This is all UCLA. Some of them are all changing next year. Right, right. Yeah, so make sure you call just to make sure. You know, I would hate for you to have to pay anything out of pocket. So, and you know, our call center is open all day long every day, right? So you can definitely call in and we'll get your insurance set up. I'm counting calories. Um, now this protein powder, so that's, let's say if I have to be on like 1,200 calories or something like mm -hmm. that. Now if I take protein powder, I still have to count that as my part of my calories. You do, correct? you do. But most of the protein powders that you find now in supermarkets or Whole Foods or Costco are all low calorie, high protein regimens. So they're all for weight loss, okay? Oh, okay? But if you went to GNC and you look for the muscle builders, then yes, those are the stuff for the muscle builders um, specifically. So really when it comes down to ratio, what you need to think about when it comes to protein powders is that for every 100 to 120 calories of protein powders, there should be about 15 to 20 grams of protein. That's a good ratio to think by. But if you see a protein powder that has 300 calories and 10 grams of fiber, those are for muscle building. And uh, the protein powders, aren't there different kinds of this plant protein? And the yes, yes, um, there are different kinds. Uh, your most normal animal type is whey protein. You'll see W-H-E-Y, which is derived from a cheese and a milk. Um, and it's processed differently. You have cheaper whey and more expensive whey. The stuff that has gone through some kind of heat is the cheaper stuff. Um, but it comes down to the taste and also what you can afford. If you can't afford to buy a shake with $3 a serving, then you're gonna to have to go with the dollar serving type. But it's all, this, it's all the same at the end of the day. It's just it's quality. W-H-E-Y is an animal whey protein. And besides, and it's derived from milk and cheese. If you, if you don't tolerate it for whatever reason, let's just say you tried it, you don't like the taste, or you get gas from the byproducts of milk and cheese, then maybe you want to try egg white protein. And there's rice ones too. Yes, yes. And, and so let's just say you can't do animal and you just don't want to do animal protein whatsoever out of you know, religious reasons and you just don't like the taste, then you have the plant proteins. The plant proteins are tricky because calorie a lot of times is a little bit higher when it comes to the animal protein powders, but it comes in all sorts and all shapes and it comes from soy, pea plant, mm -hmm. rice protein, uh, hemp, you can derive protein from a hemp plant, but you don't get high in any way, so no worries about that. Um, as well as pumpkin. Now there's a new protein derived from a pumpkin plant as well. So you can really derive protein from anything, from fruits but and I vegetables. Have that if you go to flavored ones, they have more sugar. Exactly. If you stay with vanilla and I think it's chocolate, you're better off. Yeah, there's even protein powders at Whole Foods where there's no flavor whatsoever. It's a bland powder, it's straight protein, you can just add it into everything you, you eat and you can get that type of pure protein from that. Um, key to protein powders, don't ever mix it in hot water or your coffee because it does denature it in hot water. They don't tell you that in the jar, but it is what it is. Now you know. You can do it with soy milk and stuff. You can, you can. exactly, cold. Cold of anything. It's the temperature that that denatures the natural protein, that's all. You're in the pink. The uh, denaturing, I didn't hear which protein that was. No, no, with any protein, just don't mix it in hot water. Now some of them, I thought said that you could use them like in casseroles and that kind of thing too. It depends, it depends. Um, there's a lot of diet foods, especially even from some of the weight loss centers. They, they created these proteins where you can just mix hot water or hot soup into. But right now I'm talking about the protein powders that you find at the store, at Whole yeah, Foods. I, and with digestive problems, I've been told that I should avoid whey and soy both, and so that kind of sticks me into the expensive category like Vega One, and, and, yep. and I'm wondering if there's any other alternative besides that. Well, here's the thing with protein powders, though. You know, if you buy the protein powders with the flavor and the sugars and the protein itself, these are three components of different things that could cause you to have GI upset. It's not just the protein. The protein, clean protein with no added byproducts, or what we call casein, um, 
can very well have no effect on people whatsoever. But the dirtier protein or the ones that get processed a little bit in a faster way um, have a lot of byproducts and our bodies react to it. What's that? No, you got to read the label. So when you read it, um, it'll, they'll tell you if there's the protein. First ingredient is always a whey concentrate, and then followed by casein. If you see the word casein, that's the stuff that people react to. It's a byproduct of milk isolation. Um, besides the protein, you got to think about the sugars. You have protein powders that are made with artificial sweeteners, like aspartame, as well as uh, sugar alcohols, as well as Splenda. These are all artificial sweeteners that if you take too much of can cause diarrhea. But for a lot of people, that's a good thing, right? Um, but there are also proteins that are made of stevia, which is more natural. And there are proteins that are made of pure sugar, fructose, which we can tolerate better. So, and lastly, um, sugar, flavor, and the, you know, there's different coloring dyes of the protein powder that can cause upset stomach. So it's really hard for me to say like, what's really causing your upset stomach. And I would hate for you to have to isolate that portion of supplements that you no longer can take because you don't really know what's causing the, the problem, so the GI upset, which is hard to isolate too, so. Could you again mention the ratio between? Calories to protein? Powder, 100, powder. so you mean the calories to the? Protein. Yes, so the caloric, so if you read the nutrition facts on the label, if the calories for one serving of protein powder is about 100, to 150 calories to the protein of 15 to about 20 grams of protein, that's really the ratio. That's a low calorie protein product. Yeah, that's for dieting. So once you have your total protein calculated with your body weight, and then you sort of divide up the total grams and protein that you need in a day, if you eat three meals a day, then you're gonna separate protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you make sure that in every meal you eat that many grams of protein, and you cut down on your refined sugars, your pasta, cookies, chips, all junk food. <laughs> I know all the stuff that we truly enjoy. Um, and eat lots of fiber. The fiber really helps you feel full, feel fuller longer, and stabilizes your sugar and cholesterol. Naturally, you can lose about two pounds a week just doing simple things like that. Aiming for 30 grams. 30 grams of fiber a day. What helps lower your triglycerides? What's that? What helps lower your triglycerides? Increasing your fiber and eating less of the uh, uh, high fructose corn syrup, the sugars, the refined sugars. Yeah, a lot of people, they, you know, when you come, when you go see your doctor and you get a reading that says, oh, your triglycerides are really high, naturally we think about, oh, stop eating the red meat. But it's not about just the red meat. You know, it's about the high fructose corn syrup that we eat in our juices and our sodas and the bread and pasta. Also the medications that we use also hit the liver where it causes us to retain the triglyceride as well. If you're on steroids or hormone replacement, that could increase this, that would increase the triglyceride. Um, drinking alcohol could increase your triglycerides as well. So, but if you eliminate all these things I just mentioned and you still have a really high triglyceride, then you're gonna have to blame your mom and dad for it. This thyroid? Thyroid too, thyroid too, yep. But sometimes when you have a, if you have abnormal thyroid and abnormal triglyceride, you don't go treating the triglyceride. You gotta go treat the thyroid because that triglyceride will come back down. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that eating a lot of raw cruciferous vegetables affects your thyroid negatively? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a portion of uh, thyroidal type uh, vegetables that could affect how your levels are. But in reality, you have to eat a lot of it to make a change. So I, I would definitely not limit someone in eating that type of vegetable just to control their thyroid. Because you know, when it comes to autoimmune diseases, it's, it's the way your body is attacking onto itself. I can treat it with a simple pill, but yet if you eat all the fruits and vegetables um, on a normal day, you're gonna, you're gonna get way more benefit than not eating it and trying to treat your thyroid. Yes? Which fiber supplements do you recommend? Like there's Vena fiber, mm -hmm. or there's uh, flaxseed? Fiber is a fiber. I don't have any favorite brands, but the most common ones that you see at the supermarket comes down to Metamucil and Citrusel. You gotta remember these two are different types of fiber. One's a soluble fiber, which is Citrusel. It's the, I don't remember the color of this jar, like white, bland, yellow jar. Whereas Metamucil is your bright orange jar. 
Metamucil are your insoluble fiber. Citrosyl is your soluble fiber. You sort of need a combination of both um, to, for good colon health. Uh, but people don't think about soluble versus insoluble. Soluble fiber are basically for people with constipation. You just don't go enough, and you feel like everything is stagnant, and you need more roughage. And that's what Metamucil is for. Metamucil so, is insoluble? Insoluble, correct. And uh, soluble is your citrus cell, which is great for housing the little probiotics in your colon. Your colon loves soluble fiber. But you really need both. And you can eat a combination of one or the other. And most of the soluble fiber are found in fruits and vegetables as well, um, as well as the insoluble. So if you just stick with whole foods and eating good combination of fruits and vegetables, you're going to get the combination of insoluble and soluble. Or maybe you just you hate vegetables and you just don't want to eat and prepare anything whatsoever in colors. Then yes, supplements would be your best bet. Can you repeat again the... Soluble fiber helps for your Probiotics. You, have, you heard of probiotics, yeah. the little bacteria in your colon. So soluble fiber is more probiotic? It likes your, your, your bacteria in your gut, which are probiotics. They love soluble fiber, which is your, oh. your yeah. So that makes you? It makes you go, keeps okay. the colon healthy. And the idea of having probiotics in your gut is to kill off other things that cause cancer. So that's the whole idea. And you know, you can spend lots of money on probiotics. Each month I know people- There's probiotic tablets. There are, and it could cost as little as $20 a month to $100 a month. But the fact is, why are we feeding ourselves bacteria when we can keep them happy by eating fruits and vegetables? And doesn't yogurt have probiotics? Yogurt has probiotics as well, exactly. Exactly. So you are, if you're consistent with your yogurt intake, you can very well provide all, this, all the little bacteria that you need. So, you know, but there's a supplement to everything nowadays. So, yeah, let me bring up something. As you age, mm -hmm. your absorption of the uh, yogurt might not be as good. Correct. Correct. I, I totally agree with you. As we age, or our system breaks down, we it's not as efficient. Sure. That's true. That's true. And that's why, uh, you know, you do what you can when it comes to whole foods. You know, we're talking about 2013 when 65-year-old females are as active as they are 30 years ago. And so um, people be, their lifestyle changes, society changes, and, and you either go along with the flow and change the way you eat and change the way you exercise, or you adapt to new things like supplements. And I, I mean, I like my protein supplements. Literally for morning, for breakfast and lunch, I have my protein bar and drink like eight glasses of water. But by dinner time, when dinner time rolls around, I don't cook. I'm, I consider myself a modern woman. I just don't cook. And, um, and what I do, I go out and eat at restaurants. But you, you get to pick and choose what you can and cannot eat. I obviously don't eat french fries every day. But if I could, I would. But you, know, you pick out the fruits and vegetables and anything that adds on to what I need for my body, which is lots of protein and lots of salads. So what bars do you eat? <laughs> protein bars. <laughs> um, I, I think I told you in my practice, because um, she's my client, and some of the great bars out in the communities are bars that you can get your hands on quickly and easily. Don't go crazy with the exotic brands where you can only buy from one store in the world. You gotta be realistic and buy a bar that you can find everywhere and anywhere. A good bar that I really love um, are Cliff bars, what? but not Cliff. Cliff. Oh, Cliff. You heard of Cliff. But it's not the cliff that you're thinking about. It's not the cliff with all the, the icing and all the nuts and all the granola. That's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about cliff builder. Cliff builder, there's three types. There's a cliff regular bar. It's all fancy and super sweet. It has about 8 to 12 grams of protein per bar. I don't want you to eat that one. That's the one that little kids eat. Uh, the bar that I want you to get is called cliff builder. It's a little rectangular bar. They sell at Costco, Sam's, Whole Foods, Vaughn's. Is this Cliff Builder? Yeah, Cliff Builder. Comes in all different flavors, and it has 20 grams of protein per bar. It does have 270 calories and 27 grams of carbs, but the protein counteracts that many uh, grams of carbohydrates. I use it as a meal replacement, and it's a great way to just eat the bar, have a cup of coffee, and that's it. You already have portions of vitamins as well as your protein in your day. Um, for some people, that's very unsatisfying, but to me, I'm just so busy, I can't even think. I, you know, I just want to eat and move on with my day. So you have to sort of get yourself out of the whole realm of eating for the emotional need of food as well, 
You know, some of my colleagues at UCLA, they laugh at me because I am usually just eating a bar and drinking my coffee and that's all I do. I don't even leave, you know, the, the clinic for lunch, only for reasons of you just get so many added calories when you go out, right? Lunch, I do the same. Um, so that's Cliff Builder. Uh, Builder also came up with a very high protein version called Builder Max and has 30 grams of protein. So you can literally use that as a meal replacement if you need a lot of protein into your day. Uh, another great bar is called Think Thin, very common. I'm sure you guys have heard of that one What's before. It? Think Thin. Yeah. Very, it's very good. It's gluten-free, not high fat, gluten-free, and it uses natural sweeteners, but they don't even use that much of it. So it's not as sweet as the Cliff bar, and yet it has 20 grams of protein. It also comes in this uh, lower protein version, 8 to 12 grams of protein. You don't want that one. You want the 20 grams of protein. Every time you eat a protein bar, you pick the 20 grams and higher. That also comes in all different flavors. They sell it at every store that you can think of as well. Also was created by a woman that was pregnant with her kids and wanted something natural. So it has a good story behind it. The third bar that I really truly love, a little bit more expensive, it's called Quest Bar. You can only buy that from the vitamin shop for some reason. I googled it and that's the only one store that you sell it to or distribute to. Quest. Q-U-E-S-T. A uh, good thing about this bar is they, uh, it does use a sugar alcohol. Um, some people don't like that because you know, they consider it artificial. But the fact is this uh, bar has 20 grams of protein, 170 calories. This is truly for like weight loss. You know, there's, the sugar is so little and the calories so little. But it has 19 grams of fiber, 19. So you, know, you get most of your fiber per meal and it keeps you full. And you get this, you said it's vitamin shop. Oh, vitamin shop. Yeah, there's one on Thousand Oaks. Yes? I'm glad I'm too. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, it's nice. Right. Between tossed yes. green salad and cooked vegetables, mm -hmm. which is better? Tossed green salad. Really? Mm -hmm. oh. Because of the rawness of it. Once you cook down anything with heat, you break down fiber as well. And depending on how you cook it, if you put it in the microwave, you actually can kill off vitamins and denature protein as well. So anything raw is always better than cooked. But like in my culture, we don't eat anything raw. So it is what it is, you know. Um, but you can lightly saute things. Don't cook it to steaming. death. Steaming. Steaming is also very good. Lightly steaming. Don't nuke it to death, you know. Yes? OK, but the thing is, this is what I've noticed. Lettuces don't have a whole lot of fiber in it, whereas like um, winter squash mm -hmm. is very high in fiber. So if you eat a salad, you're not going to get a whole lot of fiber unless you have, I mean, like from Cheesecake Factory or mm -hmm. a salad out, you're not going to get the fiber you need. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. So that's why mixing all your colors is key, number one. Um, don't just focus on the bed of lettuce that you end up ordering. And there are different types of lettuce nowadays, too. I, I personally hate iceberg lettuce for reasons of it has really no nutrients. I mean, even water content, there's not that much water, and there's no fiber in it. But it's cheap. It's 30 cents a head, you know? You know for some people, it makes sense. Um, but if you can really go along with better lettuces, it, the harder it is in raw form, the more fiber it has. It's not because it's kale. Spinach and mm -hmm. kale. I yeah. Have, I, that's what I you know, you can do the winter squash and salad. Exactly, exactly. The darker it is, the harder it is in raw form, the more fiber and more nutrients it has. The more bitter it has, the more cancer-fighting abilities it has, like arugula. You know, there's a reason why things are bitter for that reason. And, or bitter melon. I don't know if you guys ever tried bitter melon. It's like an Asian thing. But same idea. Yes? Well, you just made me think of this. Like, another question, because I have a bitter melon at home that I've looked at for three days wondering what <laughs> you're doing. <laughs> it's really bitter. If you don't cook it right, and then, you know, in, in my culture, you, when you cut a bitter melon, you have to sprinkle salt to sweat it out. Then the bitterness actually comes out. Then you can saute it into whatever dish you want to saute it in. But if you ate it raw, you would probably find that melon to be the worst melon ever in your life. So don't ever eat it raw. You have to sweat it out and then cook okay, it. Okay, the real question I wanted to ask. Um, on the fibers, uh, I, I wanted to find 
a way to have both soluble and insoluble. And we started trying to research the uh, active ingredients mm -hmm. online or things that she mentioned, Metamucil, or not Metamucil, because that's easy to find, Metamucil and such mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But for Benefiber and Fiber Smart and mm -hmm. the knockoff brands and that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, it doesn't tell you. It doesn't. It doesn't. And if anything, yeah. most foods don't tell you the breakdown. If you look at some of my nutrition facts, some of them just say total fiber or soluble fiber versus well, insoluble. Yeah, yeah. It comes under the labeling, like if um, you, yeah, and you don't see it, and it's not a guideline, it's not a rule. The you know the FDA or or the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture doesn't force them to label these things. You know, they only focus on calories and proteins and maybe fat nowadays, but definitely they don't make them list out fiber. So you can either just move on to the next product that does tell you, or you take it as it is. You know, when it comes to fruits and vegetables, you don't have to question it. Do some cause more more gas than others? Yes, insoluble fiber, which is the amount of muscle. Okay. Soluble is what we like. And finally, would you prefer to chew your greens or blend them and drink them, including fiber? Which is more nutritious? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, who juices here? Who has a juicer at home? I have, I have a juicer. Yeah? yeah. Do you do you juice too? Yeah, every day? Do you no, juice every day? No, you're still perhaps. Okay. Um, I love the juicer, don't get me wrong. I just love it. You know, it's a great machine. They sell they sell orange juice for six dollars a glass at Whole Foods. It makes you feel good that you're doing something for yourself. But the fact is, why are we wasting all that fiber? It, it makes no sense no, but to what me. If you drink the fiber also. Right, right. So that's why um, instead of just juicing, there are machines now yeah. that blends it, yeah. which is better than juicing. Mm -hmm. But chewing it is better than blending. Really? Because every time you cut off something or you blend something down, you're no longer requiring your own body to cut to process for you. We have teeth for a reason. And when it comes to um, digestion, it starts right when we start chewing. We have enzymes in our, in our glands that start secreting enzymes that breaks down things for us. You know? So if you start blending things, the moment you start drinking, it already bypasses all that enzyme. Now, now you'll, you'll process it in your stomach, and so on and so on. So if you have teeth, then eat. <laughs> we always recommend, use a natural physiological you know, way of doing things. Yes? So Dr. Lee, I make a, I put greens in the blender with protein powder mm -hmm. and a cup of fruit. Every, and now I'm adding some high fiber cereal in it. Yes. Um, would I be better off with that or with one of your bars? I would rather have you do the drink versus the bars. The bars, again, at the end of the day, is processed. It went through a machine, it got packaged, and it's on the shelf. Um, anything more natural, I think it's better than processed. But eating it versus putting all that in the blender. Yeah, but sometimes it's not fun to eat kale by a yeah. bunch and oranges by a bunch. You just want to blend it all together and use the taste of each thing. Like for kale, when you blend kale in a smoothie, the whole idea of squeezing some lemon or apple juice is to cut down that ass or the, the rough texture of kale. And that's why every time you order a kale salad, there's always grapefruit or some kind of lemon with it because it softens up the fiber for you. There's a, there's, a, you know, there's a reason why things are made that way. There's a reason why people squeeze lemon juice in salads before their main entree, because the lemon juice actually slows down our gut, and we feel fuller before we start the entree. Okay? Um, so yeah, I would definitely, in the most natural form, if you can chew it, chew it. If you can't chew it, then drink it as a whole. If you can't drink it as a whole, then you can just drink it as, after it being juiced. Um, but otherwise, sometimes when I look in my juicer and see all that fiber, I feel like, what can I do with this, this byproduct of my fiber, you know? And definitely that's the good stuff that I always promote people in really eating, you know? So don't, don't replace your meals with juices that you juice, because you're not doing anything for yourself but adding just a bunch of sugars into your system. One more question. I tend to be low in potassium. I have mm -hmm. a lot of food allergies, mm -hmm. and I'd rather not take potassium tablets, but it's causing severe cramps, and mm -hmm. um, I'm very big because I have chronic lymphedema, which sure. is genetic, and, and it's even in my tongue, it's spread by my body. Sure. And, um, but 
uh, I'm allergic to bananas. Um, what else? I eat tomatoes, but what else could you recommend in the potassium? Uh, avocado. Avocado has a lot more potassium than your bananas. If anything, let's just say your, your, your potassium comes back one unit low compared to the average on the blood work. And you wonder, well, how many bananas would I need to eat to change that one milli equivalent on my blood work? You would need eight feet of bananas. I don't know how long that is. Eight feet. Um, which is a lot of sugar. You can change your unit by only one unit. Uh, why would I eat 600 calories worth of bananas? It makes no sense. But if you want to find other types of foods, yeah. the avocado is a much superior mm -hmm. food for your potassium. So you may want to incorporate that every day into your, into your day. And it's good fats. How about molasses? I'm <laughs> Sure. <laughs> she probably has gallons of molasses in her cabinet as no, well. I take it every day. It is good for you. It's good for you at moderation, molasses. But, but you have to make sure you rinse your mouth afterwards because it's not good for your teeth. Oh, sure. Yeah, it decays. Yeah. So you just drink it, you don't even I cook it with it. I just drink it and I take the coffee, I'll just take a tablespoon. But it has to be unsulfured, unprocessed, you know. Yeah, yeah. Everything like, yeah, everything unprocessed is always better. I don't know about you. Or apple cider soaked in the garlic. My uncle used to take shots of that. I don't know, I mean, some people tolerate that stuff and I don't. Is apple cider vinegar good for um, it is. It, it's, uh, it, the idea is that it can, you can, it can change your pH balance. So you know how you heard about the alkaline diet? Everyone's trying to eat more things with more base, not so much acid. Uh, drinking uh, apple cider can sort of uh, cause your body to have that very short term of alkaline. And that's why people do it. It's anti-cancer. That's what they say. But who knows? I never really looked into the studies of what apple cider really does for your body. Apple cider vinegar. I yeah. Mean, so Right, you can eat down the salad dressing, but people take shots of it. So, who knows? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just like, eat your protein, eat your fiber, fruits and vegetables, bottom line, you know? Eat out once in a while, moderation in alcohol. I'm sure there are some people here with their red wines at night. Sorry, I'm going to make you repeat one thing. Sure, no problem. The citra kale is the soluble fiber. Yes, citrus oil, yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.